Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. We created this podcast to share the wonderful people we get to interact with, we get to meet, we get to know, and most importantly, get to learn from. So I invite you to join us on this journey here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. So we're here today with a, with a friend, Dr. Angela Jackson. She's one of my great COVID buddies. And we never want to ruin this by meeting in person, Angela. That would be too much fun, wouldn't it? Well, okay, maybe we'll make an exception. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Dr. Angela Jackson is someone, as I mentioned, I've gotten the opportunity to know during COVID and not only know her, but really like her and certainly respect her. What an accomplished, uh, accomplished professional you are, Angela. We'd like to focus today on uh, your one of your many ex- areas of expertise that is about the uh, future of work and the workforce and it's in a post-pandemic era and, and quite a bit beyond. But I just want to read about the company you founded called Future Forward Strategies. Uh, I, the definition is so far reaching, but tells you so explicitly what you do. You're a, a labor market intelligence, design thinking, and strategy firm that assists leaders with transforming organizations and human capital infrastructure necessary for public, private, and not pro- not-for-profit organizations to maintain competitiveness while creating positive impact. Uh, we know that you're a lecturer at Harvard in the Graduate School of Education, where you teach the next generation of students about entrepreneurship in the education marketplace. There are so many uh, paths we can go down with that description of what you do today and what you've created your organization to do. But let's start with uh, what we were just chatting about leading up to our launch today. We're on the heels of uh, the meltdown of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and and consequently Signature Bank as well. And you were talking about the impact you're concerned it will have on the venture, startup, and uh, new tech communities. Now, you're based in Boston, as you need to be, lecturing at Harvard, and as you choose to be. So tell me, what impact there in the Boston market do you think, Dr. Jackson? Well, I mean, there's a big one. You know, we have a very vibrant biotech community here. You've got startup founders who are coming out of MIT, Harvard, and other labs are working on some of the most important issues, if you think about to our health and our wellness. Um, they're using the, the dollars, the venture dollars for their startups. And, you know, Jim, I shared with you, I was on a call yesterday, you know, with the mayor of Boston, with 40 other VCs, and we're talking about the long tail effects of what this will mean when the startup economy that are working on some of these huge health issues is not being able to be well funded. What's going to yes. happen to the vendors that are partnering with, with them? What are going to happen to their employees? And most importantly, the innovation and the progress that they're making in these labs, some of that coming to a halt if they can't make payroll. You know, a lot of the conversation is about, you know, do we bail out this company? Don't we bail out? But one thing I, I'd like to really hit on is that we can't afford to have this innovation stop. You know, it would be really unfortunate what we've built up here in Boston across the country. You know, you've got a bank like SVP, you've got First Republic, who have just been really good to the innovation economy and have really helped build some of the companies that we know of today that we depend on. Yeah, I I think you're right. Uh, We'll all become a little bit more aware of the vital role these mid-sized or less than money center banks have played or playing in the creator community, the biotech community, the the pure tech community, the uh, innovation community, so much of the role they play is different than the role and responsibility, frankly, of the money center bank. So I think it's important that we all play an active role in helping to think through, understand, and shape the future of what banking support systems we need so that the whole of the economy moves forward. Because as you can see in Big Pharma, it's Little Pharma that does the risky betting and research on new products. And Big Pharma really can't afford to do a lot of the R&D kind of work. Uh, they're in a position with distribution, capital, and regulatory, and all those good leverageable things to buy the companies when they've proven that they have a drug that could get into the pipeline and be meaningful and impactful to a bunch of people's lives you're beginning to see how this ecosystem fits together. Yeah, 
and we got to talk about the little mid-sized banks, right? Um, Jim, we've talked about this before. I grew up in a small town in Illinois, and I remember my grandparents, they knew their banker. You know, it was Waukegan Northern Safe and Trust, and we'd go down there, we'd talk to our banker. When we wanted to get a car loan, you know, he'd pick up the phone and make the appointment, and far too often those days are gone. And I have to tell you, I miss those days. I know most people do, right? When you could build a relationship with your baker, you could call in a favor. And so I think there's something to be said about that too. And I talk a lot about, you know, an equitable future of work and how we can bring our economy back so that it works for more people. And I think regional banks have a big role to play in that. You talk about uh, KYC, which is an abbreviation of know your customer. So we've had to legislate that banks should know your customer. You grew up in an environment that your bank really knew its customers, uh, knew your your family. And when you wanted to have a car loan, they might say, uh, "Might you think of a used car versus a new car?" Because uh, I don't I don't know that your budget could tolerate it. Or they might have a conversation with you about maybe you should have a mortgage on your house if you don't because it's a better form of financing. It's uh, uh, the first exaggeration to the best part of it of know your customer. Absolutely. And and it was a relationship that grew, that worked on both sides. You know, you were there for your banker, your banker was there for you. I think this is just a wake up call for all of us, right? To, to really take a deep look at that. What I'd like to focus on next, uh, Dr. Jackson, is the work that you're doing. Uh, let's start with education before we get to the workplace. Tell me uh, something that gets you excited about how technology is shaping education the new forms of education. I know as a consumer, as a uh, a broken down old guy, I love uh, my access to YouTube, to podcasts, uh, to books, books, uh, audio books. I can advance my educational agenda quite, uh, quite deliberately uh, with access to so much great content. Clearly, uh, during COVID, we saw the education system have to wrestle with this complete change going to remote. What have we learned from that? And are there, are there little sparkles of excitement that you see about use of technology or new forms of communication that can advance our educational agenda in some positive ways? Yeah, so I always thought about the pandemic when we had to switch to online was the COVID bonus. If you could find kind of a, a bit of silver lining in the clouds. Uh -huh. What we were able to do in short order was what people thought we couldn't do at all. We were able to scale online learning to every single student. We were able to get Chromebooks and iPads and laptops to students. And it wasn't perfect by far. There, there were some gaps there that were exposed. But by and large, we were able to take an in-person system and put it online in a matter of weeks. And so what that gave me hope around is what we can do and what's the promise of technology. So we're in a moment now where the person who's been born that's estimated to live 150, to live to be 150 years old. That means many of us are going to have to learn new things. You know, we're going to have, you know, children who are growing up today will have, you know, 10 to 15 different careers. And traditionally, we haven't had a system where it made it easy for you to learn new things. You have to either, you know, go to high school, go to college. But like you said, now with the invent of the internet, you've got YouTube, you have accelerated learning programs where instead of taking on the debt of a four-year degree, you can take a three-month or six-month certificate and learn how to code. You can learn how to be a cloud engineer. You can learn to be an electric car charging vehicle technician. And that's a new one, right? And that was a job that was just created in the last three years. So we have innovators who are creating the jobs of the future. A lot of those skills aren't being taught in traditional K-12 or even um, post in college or university because they are new, they're being created. And that's the promise of having some accelerated learning programs that you can learn using the internet and over technology. You know that there's a dearth of uh, college age students coming through the pop population pipeline. That's gonna have a big impact on, on colleges. What you're talking about should have, in my opinion, a, a further impact on colleges as we know it, as we have known it. You know, and I know that it's very expensive now to get a four year degree, even in, in those terrific state schools. Uh, it's still a lot of money. It's four years of, of no income. It's a lot of expense. It's a lot of cost of living. Very difficult for families to afford that. 
what are you advising the families that come to you and say, should I go into debt to put my two rugrats, my three rugrats through a four year college? Well, the first thing that I'm really counseling people that I know and that I work with is there's a lot of programs now where students can gain college credits while they're in high school. So one, looking at those early college opportunities, taking a class at the local community college, I think is a huge opportunity for students to be able to try something on. There's also apprenticeships that they can take on six months, three months, that they can try on a career, a job, an externship, just to see if they're going to like it. You know, in this country, we've got about 50% of the adults who graduate who are doing something completely different than what their degree is in which you know, lets us know that we're not doing a great job at career exposure at all ages. And so how do we do that in advance so that students, right, when they're 17, 18, they're making decisions that could put them in debt for the rest of their lives, actually get a chance to try on some of these new careers. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples. There's just some great companies out there that are doing this work. Uh, one is called CodePath. It's a, it's a nonprofit. It's working with minority serving institutions. It's working with community colleges to give kids exposure to tech careers and platforms at no cost to the student. So they can actually try it before they go in debt and buy it. And you're seeing more and more of these programs come across, not only for online coding, but for all careers. There's SB Academy that you can learn sales, um, tech sales, and doing that again via distance without taking on the debt. You don't know what you don't know. So when you're coming out of high school and even if you've been a great student and you've been fortunate enough to have some exposures, you're asked to make choices about your career when you're going to go to a four-year college and pick a major that will impact the rest of your life. Now, granted, as you say, half the people with a degree are not working in the field that they thought they would be. So there is some flexibility. In my first career, I, I ran a home for teenage boys. And my job was to get my my guys, my 10 guys, when I ran one group home, my job was to get them all jobs for the summer. Because if I got them jobs for the summer, uh, they'd have money in their pocket. They'd be tired at night, which was important to me, <laughs> that, that they not be out and about. And they were getting exposures. Yeah, I mean, I've always been a, a very big fan of the America Corps, AmeriCorps program for that very reason. You know, you talk about the job for those young men. I remember my first job was working in an attorney's office. And I was filing for him. And I remember filing the fidelity statements um, in each binder for each one of his children. And I asked him, what, was, what were these statements? And he explained to me that he was starting to save for their college using these fidelity statements. And that was my first exposure to investment. Investing. And the owner of that law firm sat me down and it really, because I had interest, and explained that to me. And I told people, that's how I learned my first step in learning how to invest. And I, you know, years ago, this is probably like three years ago, I went and spoke to the Jim Moran Small Business Institute, about a thousand small business owners in Florida. And they were explaining, you know, that it's so hard to find people, to hire people right now. And I told them, I said, you know what, you have one of the most unique opportunities um, that you can give someone who's looking to work. And it's exactly what you said, Jim. You can learn so many different things when you're working for a small business owner. You know, you go to a big corporation, they have you there and you're, you know, punching in numbers. You go to a small corporation, you're learning about customer service. You're learning about running a business to your point. And I think that every, you know, if we could give one to two years for every student coming out, just imagine what they would learn. Financial literacy, you know, accounting, yep. how to speak to people and communication. These are life skills where, you know, I talk a lot about automation. You're always going to need those human skills. You're always going to need someone who's going to need to communicate with someone else. So that year of service, one, is they're giving back, but they're gaining so much, right, in terms of perspective, to your point, Jim, about different people, their place in the world. I think it's a rich opportunity. And, you know, when I, I meet students all the time who have done Teach for America, for example. Um, what a wonderful program, right? Isn't it a wonderful program? Just, again, to your point, to go in and see the lives of others to see what it means to teach, you know, to give back to students who may not um, have been as invested in, which is just amazing. And so you see those programs, I've never met a student who said they didn't wish they didn't do it. 
And many of them have gone off to be lawyers, teachers, professors, you know, investors. Um, but the one thing that many of them have in common, if you talk to Wendy Cope, who founded uh, COP, who started uh, Teach for America, they all have a real deep passion about education. Mm -hmm. And it's things that they're giving back and in their own small and large ways when they go out. So imagine having a core of Americans that are doing the same thing. One of the things that uh, uh, you touched on earlier was about having to adapt so quickly during COVID to get PCs, laptops and, uh, and iPads into the hands of uh, so many young people. We can't lose sight of the fact that a lot of young people didn't get it. Uh, here in, I live in, in the New York area, in New York City, we had 600,000 people living in public housing. Who, even if they got a laptop, they didn't have access to Wi-Fi. Uh, so some people, I think, fell a little further behind. Uh, Dr. Jackson, could we uh, hope and expect that these same tools, these same technology tools, Zoom capabilities, uh, uh, Teams capabilities, the video, which frankly saved us all through this COVID period, can they help close that gap? And the gap that I'm afraid widened during these uh, three COVID years? Well, one is, you know, you, you think about New York City, there's a million students in that, that school district. And there were, like I said, some, some short fallings, but by and large, they were able to get out there and to get the technology to the students. One thing that we should think about, and I, I'm excited about technology, and there's a couple of companies that I'll share with you. One is called Future Fit AI with with technology now, um, we can do individualized, personalized learning. Um, there's technology out there now that if a student is using it, it can assess where they are in their grade level and it can customize the, the curriculum to their needs. So it gets harder or a bit easier based on where they are. And so when you see technology- Is that behaviorally based? It is. It, they can tell in an instance that it's giving teachers access to real data. And you're seeing more and more schools take on this technology. So that again, when you've got one teacher and you've got 30 students, how do you know you're doing best for Bobby? How do we know we're getting those real-time results and we're not waiting to, you know, a quarter or two quarters in when you're getting a progress report? The teachers are- And, and you see progress. this in use in school districts now? We're starting to see- it's, It sounds terribly exciting. And it sounds prescriptive in terms of what needs are today and if we had the technology tools i'm excited to hear that it's being deployed i just this is the first i'm hearing that yeah the challenge with it is is always adoption right so it's one is what districts can afford to pay for this technology yes. um, there's budgets around it so the technology exists the challenge is, is how do you do this at scale how do you do that it's so so that it's affordable so that's still a real challenge but the technology now actually exist and we're actually using it with adults right now too so it exists i think the problem that we'll have to tackle next is the scale and how to pay for it and then also the willingness right because the other thing that you have in front of a student is you have a teacher who has to learn that technology as well to make sure that they're not the gatekeeper into the student so there's other barriers that we have but again it's showing promise that we can see it and that it's happening. Now it's about how do we make sure it gets in front of every single student. Uh, well, that is exciting uh, that there are some of those technologies being deployed because uh, I, I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't admit that a bunch of kids fell behind. Uh, it's not gonna help them on the social or the physical or the uh, other ways that they might've fallen behind, but on the academic, which is important to all those others that they might have a chance to catch up with good effective use of technology is exciting. What did you see happen in the, in the school uh, environment, the educational environment, and as importantly, in the workplace environment during COVID that you have your antenna up about? Well, a couple of things, and, and we're seeing this now, still the impacts of the COVID pandemic you know, on children and also adults. And, and Jim, I have to tell you, you know, I have um, a 17-year-old stepdaughter, you know, I saw it at home, what happened, the isolation that the children felt, you know, by nature, they're social, and by nature, people are social. Uh, you know, a good a friend of mine wrote this book, The Lost Art of Connecting, Susan McPherson, and, you know, she told me, I was talking to her, she said, I wrote that book because I was lonely. It was the first time, you know, I'd been a year and hadn't really been in contact with another human and had a hug, you know, because of the, the COVID pandemic. And so really thinking about and going back to technology is 
One, how do we begin having these conversations about loneliness and understanding the impacts that they're having for youth, that they're having for you know, aging Americans? How are we making it more of table stakes that we're talking about how we, how we deal with that? Um, also, we saw this with emerging leaders. You know, Jim, I was on the phone. I remember uh, with a local uh, peer here, colleague, and you know, he he was late to the meeting. He goes, you know, one of our junior top analysts came in, and he was having su suicidal thoughts. And one thing that his firm did, which I thought was really important, is begin centering mental health not only offering the benefits, but starting to have the conversations like you would about parenting, like you would about other medical conditions. You know, how do we bring those conversations that would be typically outside of the workplace, bring them in the workplace so we can tackle issues that people might not normally tackle or might have some stigmas around them. We put our heart into everything we do. We are farmers, bakers, florists, and makers who grow and create with a passion. 1-800-Flowers, share with love. How do we become a workplace that encourages people to talk about their difficulties if they're having them, yet avoid the situation where they feel like they might be stigmatized if they bring it up, or in fact, they might be? Yeah. Well, I mean, one is, you know, we talk a lot about this, and I created, Jim, this equitable future of work framework and just really understanding what does it mean for a person to be able to come in and really bring their whole selves to work? And one thing that happened with the pandemic, when I keep talking about this bonus, is that, you know, just like you're talking to me now, I'm in my, you know, my office at my home. You know, we were invited into people's homes. We're intimate in a way for two plus years that we had never been before. And so going back to business as usual rule, where we think people aren't dealing with, you know, caregiving issues or housing issues or health issues, those need to be table stakes. So when I am working with companies and CEOs and, and managers, Management, we're really talking about when you're checking in with people on that weekly basis, is it just about the work? Are we first checking in human to human? That's one. The second thing that we're looking at the companies who are leading on this, Jim, are really thinking about how they reimagine benefits. Um, and so by that, I mean, thinking about we always offer 401k, you have certain companies that offer a free lunch or, you know, a discount to the gym, but really ask beginning to take those dollars and say to an employee, this is how much we spend per employee on a benefit. What would benefit you? And really asking them what would help them in that moment. And I'll give you know, we call those cafeteria plans. Well, well, it's funny that you call those cafeteria plans, but there's new companies like Compt, is C O M P apostrophe T. What they're doing is they will let people take the funds and use them how they want. So this could be an emergency loan that you might need for your car. This could be caregiving benefits if you have an older mother or father that you're looking for. So it's again, it's destigmatizing them. And I know we've had them before with cafeteria, but how do you make sure that people are actually using them? You know, I was working with the CEO of a fast casual restaurant. He had given his frontline workers 401k and he was surprised because no one took him up on it. And, you know, he, and I was like, well, did you ask him? We end up doing a survey. And, you know, we found out what, you know, I had a hypothesis about was that, you know, people didn't feel like they could afford to do it. He sure. took these dollars and he put them into an emergency fund. He saw retention go up. When he did that same survey, he said that the employees felt like they cared about them, like they saw wow. them. And that's a huge piece. There was just a survey that came up from Gallup. And you've got about 40% of U.S. workers who saying they don't think that their employers care about them. I mean, that's really strong. When you think about all the money that we're putting out, all of the benefits, you know, at the end of the day, perception is reality. We're doing a lot of things, but if people aren't using them and they don't feel like it's meeting their individual need, then you might as well not be doing it at all because it's not really making that difference. Dr. Jackson, it seems to me that the role of an employer, of an HR department, when the company is large enough to have an HR department, over the last few years, it's just gotten tougher and tougher and tougher. All these other things we have to consider, uh, work from home, not work from home. How do we compensate for mentorship that's not taking place when people aren't in the office? 
how does the conversation that happens when the meeting ends and you walk back down the hall and you're walking side by side with someone, how do you replace that conversation? How do you, uh, how are you concerned about the changing needs of your workplace, keeping up with technology, planning for the future, loneliness, social connectivity, career development, skills development, the role of an employer and the role of employee employers that have HR departments has just gotten tougher. Absolutely. And I think that we have to acknowledge that. And I think we have to have a conversation about that. You know, there was another survey that came out, Jim, that said employees trust their employers more than they trust the government more than they trust institutions of higher learning. And that's the Bertelman's uh, trust survey and a trust barometer. If you think about that, there is a lot of pressure that is put on employers in this moment. And so I think part of it is you're seeing more employers, one, begin to really communicate and to really be vulnerable and to really make table stakes what they're dealing with. Gone are the days where you can be a boss, go on the back office and try to figure everything out. It's too much to figure out now. It's really thinking about how do we bring communities together within the organization to help us sort through these issues, right? It's more about this kind of employee owner mindset and giving people table stakes in that because what we're experiencing now, it's not slowing down. You know, we're, we're waiting for another pandemic to come. And how do we deal with this, this topic with the companies you consult with? Okay, I'd like to have Dr. Angela Jackson come in and work with us. As an employer, I'm sort of sitting there saying, oh, she's going to suggest that we have more time off for caregiving, more time off for mental health, more time. And, and at the end of the day, the small business person, the medium business person, and the big business person are all saying to themselves, can we have a workday dispersed here somewhere? Because I still have to get the work done. Absolutely. And the question I always say when I'm brought in is, we still have to get the work done. Does it need to be done between nine and five? Or could there be other times? Where's the flexibility there? And what's fascinating, Jim, if you look at surveys of companies that have unlimited time off, people don't take it. <laughs> Americans like to work. As we've, let's, we had the pre-COVID period, we had COVID, hopefully we're in late COVID now, post-COVID, the idea of the workplace, the workforce has changed forever. Give us some predictions when when you and I uh, meet in person, let's say three years from now, and uh, we're sipping a nice glass of a Sauvignon Blanc uh, before dinner. What- I hope you're buying, Jim. <laughs> always, always be happy to. What are we talking about, about how the workplace has changed between today and 2023 and and tomorrow in 2026. Yeah, we're going to be talking about this new generation of workers. You know, we've got, you know, baby boomers who are retiring at light speed. When we have economic downturns, you're going to see people who need to stay in the labor market more and longer and who, who want to. And I think some baby boomers who are pulling back are pulling back from maybe a nine to five job, but they're still staying engaged in other ways, right? Um, it's it's two things that both, there's the folks who have to, there's the folks who can afford to retire, who may not feel like retiring. They're, they're feeling in really good health and want to stay engaged that way. So I think that a couple of things are gonna happen is you're gonna see more and more of this multi-generational workforce. We're already seeing a lot of the gig workers. We're going to see that continue. You're going to see people knitting together two or three opportunities, um, not just because they have to, it's because they want to, um, and they can work at different times. And we're seeing more and more. I worry about the stress of that. It sounds nice, but I people I know that have done that have a lot of stress. Well, I think people have a lot of stress anyway. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about a young woman that works with my organization now. You know, she works on our comms team. Um, she calls herself a digital nomad. You know, we're a very distributed team. You know, sometimes she's in Europe, sometimes she's in South America. She feels fulfilled in terms of putting together the two or three jobs. You know, we've tried to give her more hours. She said, no, she actually likes doing different things. I think for us that were raised in a different type of nine to five, you know, I, and I told you, I was raised by my grandfather who, you know, started the Chrysler factory and retired at the Chrysler factory. I don't know that that exists in large scale anymore. Your granddad, how old was he when he retired? He was 66. So 66, but he was doing physical work. 
He was. Retiring from physical work, I understand that. And let's not lose sight of the fact that when they put in the Social Security system in the 1930s, uh, that the life, that they said 65 is the retirement age, life expectancy was below that. Yes. So it was uh, actuarially designed to not spend a lot of money on retirees because there was no expectation that they would be there. So fast forward now, you're saying, you said earlier on, Angela, that someone born today could reasonably expect to have a lifespan of 150 years. So 65 doesn't work anymore. At Harvard Graduate School of Education, where I'm on faculty, we have a program that's a collaboration between Harvard Business School, the Kennedy School, and the School of Education called the Advanced Leadership Initiative. And you have CEOs who've had you know, successful careers who are retired, who feel like they have something else that they want to do. And so they come back to campus to start either another organization or a nonprofit or initiative like the one that you described, because they still have a lot to give. And so I think having a workforce and education system that easily has on ramps and off ramps for people like that will be important in a longer term. And so that's very different than saying you go to high school and you're done, you go to college, and you're done, you know, you're not done when you're 23, 24, even if you finish grad school, how can someone like an advanced leadership initiative at Harvard, how could you have that at your local community college? How could you have that with these accelerated learning programs that I've showed you so that people can have an unwrap without going into six figures of debt when they still have a ton to contribute to society? But I, I think based on what you've been saying, you're a, a big believer, as has been the case in your own life, about the concept of resume is no longer a noun, it's a verb. And you ought to be thinking about learning as a lifelong pursuit. Absolutely. You know, you're reminding me there's a movement now, a nascent movement of having kind of electric employment, electronic employment records. So people can do just that as they have experiences, something that they could have that they could take from employer to employer that they would own that shows what they've learned. And, and why that's important is two thirds of U.S. residents don't have a bachelor's degree. You know, they're what some folks call skilled through alternative routes. You know, when you look at numbers of people who've served in the service, like we were talking earlier, you're looking at upwards of 70 percent don't have four year degrees. And we know that the folks have you know served in our, in our armed ser services have been trained and well trained. But again, what do you have that you can carry with you to talk about? what you've learned and how those skills are transferable. So we have a lot to do in that realm. And I think employers like yourself, when you talk about what you're doing at 1-800-Flowers, by you all promoting that, encouraging you know, your staff to talk about what they've done, be it while they're on vacation, be it what they're doing after hours or before work on the weekends, that's helping them to be able to communicate if they were to go to another employer, how they're still gaining skills and learning. And, and that's the other thing that I talk about with a lot of employers, and you're seeing this now, you know, you say, oh, we want to retain everyone. Well, the fact of the matter is people are leaving more. How do you become that best in class employer that people may leave, but may come back to? and seeing more. They may go somewhere else, get some more skills and come back. And how does that look that we're preparing people for their next best job? And that's how we're getting some of the loyalty that we hope from the staff and from the employers. So I, I just want to applaud you all for doing that work. Because it's well, well, it's it's selfish too, uh, Dr. Jackson, because I want our people to be, I want the people we attract to be the kind of people who, hey, how was your weekend? Well, I sat around eating Cheetos and watching uh, and uh, and binging on Netflix all weekend. Oh, what did you do, uh, Janet? Oh, well, I, you know, I volunteer on Saturday mornings at the local food kitchen. On Sundays, uh, we have a, a, I, I went to uh, our church services and we had a big program in the afternoon where we invited senior citizens to come join us. We put on another program. Who do you think of those two has a better social life and who's the employee, the, the, the uh, team member here who is going to, volunteer for that extra project and make sure something that needs to get done gets done. Well, we know it's the latter. So we're selfish because I want to attract those people. I want to give them environment and, 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 and create an environment for them where they feel like we're investing in their development and in their future, because indeed I want us to be. And selfishly, I think those people are going to stick around here longer and make a bigger and better contribution if we craft the right cultural environment. And I know that's what you work with organizations on doing. And I'm going to press you to help us build out this lifelong learning concept 
where we where we keep track of everything that people do to learn and develop at the workplace, in formal education, and beyond. That's incredible. I mean, really incredible. You have to think there's still about 40% of workers and employers, excuse me, employers who are thinking about this. And so there's really room for leaders in this. And it is going to be employers who are the leaders in these like nascent movements. Because if you think that you're doing it at 1-800-Flowers, you think that employer who goes from there, we're talking about it, you'll get it out to your audience. I can't wait to tell other people about the work that you're doing too, because employers can actually lead in this regard. Unfortunately, you've got this disconnect between K-12 and you know post-secondary and the world of work. We need those closer collaborations. So the more that employers are leading on this front and can talk about what skills are useful in the world of work, we're going to have more people who are engaged and ready to meet those demands and meet the moment. Talk to us employers who are saying, okay, I hear what you're doing, and we want to be on the forefront of the appropriate measurements of ESG. We want to make sure that we're doing the right things in terms of inclusivity, diversity, governance. We want to make sure we're doing all those things. But tell me how it really benefits me. And I know uh, you cited for me one other time uh, the results of a McKinsey study on measuring companies effectiveness and the correlation with their diversity and ESG at all uh, uh, measurement uh, compliance. Give me, share with me, okay, I got six skeptics around the table here. Tell us how we should be embracing these ideas even more fervently because of how it's beneficial to us. Well, let's just start one. Investors are really looking at this. You've got investors who want to understand. Don't tell me why we have to. Tell me why we should want to. Well, that's what I'm telling you why you want to. If you're, <laughs> you're investment ready, right? If you're if you're not out there seeking capital, and I say investment, you think stockholders, shareholders. You've got people who are looking at the numbers. Bankers. <laughs> exactly. And I think the biggest thing for companies to think about is, should we should we not be doing this? The one thing is, for any company that's on the fence about this, just begin looking at the numbers. I think start measuring and see what the numbers are telling you. You know, it's not about being good or being bad. It's about being better than you were, right? And so you're not able to do that if you don't even know where you stand on these numbers. You have to keep score. You have to know what your metrics are. You got to know what your metrics are. You don't want to be caught flat-footed, right? Because, you know, it takes a lifetime to build a reputation. All it takes is one social media influencer out there to out you. So it's one, it's just not worth it when you can measure it and be proactive. That's number one. Number two, you can also build your narrative of what you're trying to do to get better. No one's expecting anyone to be perfect. But if, again, if you've measured it and you start putting a plan in place, then you'll be ready if the SEC is coming down, looking more at public companies and looking at their how they're treating their human capital. You'll be ready for that. You'll have your own metrics. The last thing that we want to think about is there's just a big opportunity. And I, I really do hate that ESG is starting to get so politicized because really what it's about is, again, an employer being a good community member. How are you treating the environment? How are you treating your human capital? And that's good. When you're in a good environment, you're, you're being a good community partner. That means you're investing in the community. You're investing in schools. That means that's going to be a place that people want to come work to. You'll be able to retain and attract talent. So not using it as a stick for people, but really using it as a measure to say, how can we be a, a better, our best in class employer? I don't think there's anything wrong to strive for that. And it's not doing that because someone's mad at you, but it's something I think we should all strive towards of being a best employer. Our community has heard this from me before, but they're going to have to listen again. I agree with you. When big business decides that this is the right thing to do and we're going to do it, and they put their oomph behind it, it happens. It, it has a tremendous cultural benefit. We talked about the cultural societal benefits that I think the military brings to our country. Well, when when big time corporate America, when Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan says, we're going to have these scores. We've been keeping score now, and we're going to move those those numbers from here to here. You know what's going to happen, and you know it has a big social and and uh, and environmental benefit. So I, I think you're right. I think when 
big business does it, then medium-sized business does it, then small business does it. And that's where real change takes hold. And I don't think business gets enough credit for the societal changes and benefits that they brought to this country. We all pat ourselves on the back when we pass some legislation, but it's when you get it's important to me, it's the right thing to do kinds of thinking in the business community that real change happens. And I know that's been a big part of your efforts in terms of working with not-for-profit organizations, working for the educational system, and working with a for-profit world to engineer and design programs where at the very least, you know where, where you stand on the scale, you know how you can impact it, and you're gonna keep score along the way. Things will improve. That's exactly it. And I think we need to be kind to ourselves. You know, most people come to work trying to do the right thing. And I know, Jim, you said, you know, sometimes I give people too much credit, but I really do believe that, you know, business when doing right and operating well, everyone wins, the community wins, the community thrives. And so instead of us being on a witch hunt, right, it's how do we help people get better? How do we be more transparent? How do we be more human? And I think, you know, these latest instances where people are not being as forthcoming are the challenges that we see. I think, again, making numbers visible, saying, you know, get, making an honest commitment and working towards it. I think people get a lot of credit for doing that. Uh, how else could a company think a company or an organization think about reaching out to you and and your team, the future forward strategies? How should they think about engaging with you to make things better in their workplace? Well, two things. One, I am working on a book project now where I'm highlighting companies who are interested in doing this work. Again, we're, we're highlighting best practices, people who are trying to try something new that gets more people engaged in the future of work. So if you're an employer where you're saying, you know what, I think I might be interested in these employee records, call me. We're doing some research over at Harvard Graduate School of Education. We'd love to bring you in. We want to write about it. We want to talk about it. We want to give a platform to businesses that are doing this work. If you're an employer and you're saying, I'm trying to figure out now how I close this generational divide between the employees. We know we've got a lot of millennials that are coming in. Um, that's where we can help, too. And really thinking about those multi-generational strategies and also really thinking about how do we create a best in class workplace and really focusing on that middle management. So folks can reach me, um, Dr. Angela Jackson and Harvard University. I'll pop up there. Um, they can also always reach me at Angela at DrAngelaJackson.com and more than happy to, to help and to also match make. Um, I'm working with other researchers and professionals who care deeply about these issues. And again, we strongly believe that business being business is the biggest force for good. Thanks for sharing all your insights with us. It's, it's amazing how deep you are in so many different areas and the, the fact that you're an educator the fact that you've uh, been an entrepreneur, that you've stood up for-profit, not-for-profit companies, and now you're able to bring that breadth of knowledge and experience in such a coherent way to uh, to people and their needs in the workplace is, is terrific. And I have a couple of ideas just from what you said on how we'd like to follow up with you. But thanks for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and your wisdom today. I, I think a lot of us uh, who are uh, employers of one or more <laughs> will certainly benefit from hearing your thoughts and and with engaging with you in the future. So thank you, Dr. Angela Jackson. Oh, thank you, Jim. It was such a pleasure. There's no day like a birthday. It's a time to celebrate. Every year, every wish that brought you to this point. Wrapped in birthday love, toasting a future as bright as the moment before you. The best gift is each other. Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon.